Good morning, everyone. I, along with my co-chair, Brett LaPere, would like to welcome you all to Art & Bloom Homegrown, presented by Iberia Bank First Horizon. We are so very thrilled to be celebrating both in person and online today. Thank you all for signing up virtually and to all of our committee members for their hard work to make this a success. Before I introduce our wonderful speakers, I want to make a few quick announcements. We have boxed, boxed lunches for everyone available outside of the cafe after the lectures. The museum has set up some tables in the sculpture garden across the street to enjoy as a picnic if you would like to stay for lunch. I hope everyone will also take a few moments to check out our fabulous silent auction set up directly adjacent to us here in the Dathel and Tommy Coleman courtyard. The auction will be online through this Monday at noon, so we hope you will register online and bid on some of our great offerings. We are expecting our premier artist, Andrew Lamar Hopkins, to join us this afternoon, so we hope you can all meet him. He is fabulous. I, um, I am now pleased to introduce our extraordinary speakers. We have Margot Shaw, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Flower Magazine. Now, in its 13th year, the magazine has grown to include features on homes, gardens, entertaining, and lifestyle. Margot is a sought-after speaker at antique and garden shows, museums, botanical gardens, and interior design centers. She is the author of the newly released book, Living Floral, Entertaining and Decorating with Flowers. She is also the author of Styling Nature, A Masterful Approach to Flower Arranging, and the creator of the Flower Flash, public street arts installations made with flowers. We also have Richard Keith Langham, who has been a force in the decorating world for 30 years. Langham's keen eye and tremendous talent serve well in assembling his signature rooms with some of New York's most legendary ladies, including Mrs. William F. Buckley Jr. and Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Langham has been named to El Decor's A-List and Architectural Digest AD100 and is in demand as a speaker around the country. His book about decorating the remarkable rooms of Richard Keith Langham was published in October 2017. Both Margot and Keith's books will be available for purchase after the lectures in the Grand Hall. We hope everyone will stay around and meet these incredible gurus of their field. Thank you, Keith and Margaret, for coming today. I know you are both dear friends, and we are so excited to have you. Welcome. Good morning. Oh, yeah, it works. So thank you all for coming today. And I know this is risky. Not really. Um, <laughs> I hear that New Orleans is a almost 100% vaccinated city. And of course you are. Um, but anyway, I want to thank the Garden Study Club and Catherine and everybody involved, our two chairs, who I just met, who are fabulous, for inviting me here. The last time I was here for the Garden Study Club was 10 years ago. Who heard me then? Now, oh, come on. <laughs> okay, this is much better. <laughs> Let me tell you why. The last time I was here... We ate at a restaurant that shall remain nameless, and the, um, that night, in the middle of the night, I began to throw up a lot. And, but by the time I had to speak, I had uh, several Coca-Colas and some crackers, and I went on, and I was so weak and relaxed, I really didn't give an S about how it went, and it went great. <laughs> so anyway, now we have this new book, and um, I am trying to pay back my advance, so please buy one. Um, but anyway, I am here to tell you a little bit about the book and a little bit about um, my provenance in, in flowers. And I was very surprised when this all gelled in my heart and mind because I had no background in flowers. Birmingham is a huge flower town, 
but my mother was one of those people who knew who to call. And I inherited that in my DNA, it's just knowing that good, that right person. But um, I was intimidated about flowers, and so I just didn't do anything um, forever. But then when we started the magazine, I started thinking, where is this love coming from? And I had this memory all of a sudden of being, I lived on a place called Shook Hill Road, and it was very rustic, pastoral, country, um, you know, five, six acre lots, and I was like five, and I remember just rambling the hills by myself and coming upon this carpet of color in Betty Yo's garden and saying to myself, those are pretty, I want those, and then harvesting all of her hyacinths. <laughs> and of course not knowing what they were then, but um, taking them home to my mother. Meanwhile, Betty Yo was in the second story of her house spying me doing this and then calls my mother and says, Caroline, you've got a surprise on the way. And so, and I did, I thought it was, oh, won't she be so proud of me with this bushel of um, hyacinths, but she was waiting at the door brandishing a hairbrush. And for those of a certain age, you know what that meant. Um, now they would call DHR or something, Child Protective Services, but so I got the message, but now whenever I smell hyacinths, I get this tingling in my backside, and so... To steal. <laughs> so anyway, I don't really buy hyacinths that much, but... Um, and so then the next memory that I had was my mother was this tiny steel magnolia, I mean my grandmother, and she did not get me. I rode horses, played field hockey, I was a tomboy, and she was all ruffles and frills and white gloves, and she just did not get me. But one day, I was at her house on Cherokee Road in Birmingham, and I looked out the window, I was about 11, getting ready to go to the barn, I looked out the window, and there was this carpet of daffodils same larcenous thought. I go out and harvest as many as I can, throw them in the sink in her pantry, and start pulling vessels. I didn't care, I didn't know. I mean, I'm sure they were Sevres and Waterford and all kinds of wonderful things, and I was just stuffing daffodils into them when she came upon me. And she, for the first time in my life, I think she thought, okay, there's hope. <laughs> They're a vestige of femininity in this child. So, you know, flowers, are, there's a mixed message for me in that, the sort of punishment and then the approbation. And so, um, <clears throat> but the love of beauty, I can trace to both of my parents. Uh, we grew up, after Shook Hill, we went to Switzerland for about three years. And my father was a great esthete, and my mother learned from him, and she was a wordsmith. But... We went all over Europe, six and eight years old, and I remember my father saying for like weeks, we're going to the Louvre, we're going to the Louvre, and you're going to see the, um, well, I can't remember which, which one it was, uh, the Mona Lisa. Yeah, just a small, <laughs> forgettable painting. Um, you're going to see the Mona Lisa, and just big talk, really talking it up. And so my brother and I were so excited to go to the Louvre and see the Mona Lisa. And we wait in line, and we get there, and um, we're six and eight, remember, and we get there behind the olive velvet rope. I remember like it was yesterday. And, and my father says, and there she is. And we look up, and there's this small painting behind glass of a pretty homely woman Right? Let's be, I mean, sacrilege, I know, but she was. She is. And um, I know I'm in a museum, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but anyway, we were so let down. And my father, I remember he registered our looks of disappointment and he grabbed us by the hand and said, Come with me. And he dragged us through all the concourses and hallways of Versailles and I mean, uh, the Louvre went down and around and up and said, okay, now stop, look at this. And there at the top of the steps was the winged victory of Samothrace. I don't know, has anybody seen that? Shaft of light coming through and this incredibly dramatic statue and uh, thousands of years old. And even at six years old, I, I can remember registering, okay, now this is, this is some stuff. 
And I remember that feeling, and it never left. And so I trace that as sort of the beginning of my love of art and art history and beauty and flowers and things like that. So fast forward to 1986. I am in rehab. Um, I am 35 years sober now at this point, opiates, so praise God. Um, very grateful. And, um, but I'm in rehab, and I, my mother's down in Palm Beach, and she's the one who knew who to call. And so it's Tuesday. I get rubrum lilies from her in rehab. And there's a note, love you, mama, whatever. She had called, I had been called Saturday by her doctor in Palm Beach telling me that she had died. So kind of a downer, I know, but, but it's cool because now when I smell lilies, she is immediately evoked. She is Im immediately in my heart and in my spirit. And so what had happened was she knew who to call. She'd call Malloy Love in Birmingham, Mountain Brook Flower Shop, and he couldn't get the order out in time. And so they were closed Sunday and Monday, and I got them Tuesday, and it was like this message from beyond. And I know that sounds kind of woo-woo, but it really was and is very special. So if anybody loves me here, you will send me lilies, <laughs> Gates. <laughs> so anyway, so then about seven years later, um, I married this scamp and um, Gates Shaw, who, anyway, I'm not going to embarrass him, but may, I might. No, anyway, um, so Gates was pushy and a pusher and not he was he was just pushy and so he spotted some talents in me and he urged me to develop those talents and then our oldest daughter got married and i knew who to call and i called sybil sylvester and she came in who has ever done an at-home wedding they have support groups for us and we can talk later but what was i thinking well i knew who to call and so i worked for nine months with sybil and um, I recognized what a beautiful, life-giving art form uh, floral design was. And so after it was over, I called her and said, may I please come to work with you? You don't have to pay me. I might pay you. And she said, sure. So I was a 46-year-old intern, and Sybil was so gracious and generous and taught me everything I know about flowers. A couple of years in, I was in the Atlanta airport, Christmas vacation, heading to the islands, gathered up about $60 worth of magazines to find this much about what I loved. And this voice in my heart said, there's no flower magazine. You've bought a bunch of garden magazines and shelter magazines. And I was like, okay, well, so you need to start a flower magazine, literally. And so I did. It's a lot more to it than that, but I do live in Birmingham, Alabama, which is probably, you know, is a publishing mecca. And um, so it was easy and sad at the same time because a lot of titles were shuddering, including Southern Accents. And so I kind of stood at the side door of Southern Progress and said, come on to my house. To people like Karen Carroll, the um, editor-in-chief of Southern Accents and Alice Welch Doyle and just a lot of wonderful refugees from Southern Progress. So I really didn't have to do much. I had all these experts who taught me about starting a magazine and writing and uh, all the things that I needed to know. They sort of magically appeared. And um, fast forward again, I've got this great team, and Julie Durkee, who was Julie Sanji, some of y'all know her from Alexandria, but she called me and said, from Atlanta, she was our publisher, and said, you need a book. You need to do a book. And um, I said, I don't have time to do a book. And then I looked around and realized I had an incredible team assembled after 10, 11 years. And so I could take the time off. and work on this book. So I started casting about with a book proposal and um, I sent it to several publishers who shall remain nameless and then I sent it to Rizzoli, which I was like, 
They'll never want it. They're the gold standard. They'll never want it. They don't know who I am, blah, blah, blah. They wanted it. They wanted to do a book with us. And so this is the product of that that you're going to see right now. Uh, Karen Carroll and Lydia Somerville also wrote. We split the writing duties, so it's not just me. And um, we had some existing content, which made it easier. I had an in-house graphic designer, art director, who laid out the book. So I think it was pretty attractive to Roselli because they didn't really have to do much um, until the end. So I, again, um, still paying back that advance. So when this is over, um, and if you want me to sign it, I will. So this is our cover. This is um, B Cottage in East Hampton that used to belong to Francis Schultz, who's one of our contributing editors. And um, sadly, she sold that house, but um, we still have this as a memory. This is one of Charlotte Moss's uh, fabric slash wallpapers, and it's called Caroline. And I lined the book with that because my mother, Caroline, was the wordsmith, and that's where my love of words came down. So I thought that would be a nice nod to her. Then Michael Devine, another friend, um, has a line of fabrics and wallpapers, and so we used those for the dividers, the seasonal dividers. The book is divided into seasons. This is not um, a tome that, a, it's a resource, but it's individual tastemakers and designers and, um, and how they live and decorate and entertain with flowers, which is kind of part of my message that you don't have to be a professional. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's better if you, you're not. They have just done several simple arrangements and then you'll see some more complicated things, but it's also about interior design and gardening. So it's a little bit of everything, but it's their personal take and then you have some uh, tips in a sidebar at the end. So this is Elaine Griffin, who's also, that's not her, that's a table. Elaine Griffin is, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm tired. Elaine Griffin is one of our contributing editors. She is a, um, an interior designer from Sea Island, Brunswick, Georgia. And so we asked her to put together a luncheon for us. And this is what she did. It's, it's a cloister. And the flowers, the colors. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not afraid of a color commitment. And so if you come to our house, you will see that. And the magazine is pretty colorful. We don't have many white rooms. Although there's a place for that, not just not in our magazine or in my house. But <laughs> these, so anyway, this is our server with our wonderful um, exotic drinks and the beautiful mixed um, arrangement. And what I really like about this is this is really my message or one of my messages about flowers and entertaining. <clears throat> Elaine is super preppy. She never ever wears a solid color or a neutral and um, so but she did for this but in in this particular tableau she found some vintage lily and had it um, vinylized laminated and used it as her jumping off point for this particular scheme but what I really like is that there's no arrangement here it's all just um, some monastera leaves and gardenia topiaries, and then some citrus, which is, there's nothing new about that, but it's still cool when it's in a sort of tropical uh, spot. That is a runner, and um, we call, I called it, when I first saw it, the money shot, and then my young staff members told me that's a porn term, so <laughs> I quit using it. Um, <laughs> except for today. But um, I just, I love the touch of the little peonies on the um, plates and just pulling, you know, just pulling out that pink, which, and, and so the runner is, um, unfortunately, in this case, was done in Oasis and Chicken Wire. I would advocate now that you not use chick, uh, Oasis because it doesn't biodegrade. But then when we shot this, I wasn't there, and I don't think, you know, you got, you got to do what works. So there's Elaine in her non-print dress and um, fixing the flowers, and here's her food dog that she bought. She bought several of these at Michael's for $16 and had them um, spray-painted 
And so that, this is part of the hollow thing. There's nothing new about that, but it's so effective and it's so easy. So these are the favors that we had made. And who here likes a favor at a party or what? Okay, who here likes to do a favor? <laughs> okay, see me later. Because I don't. I don't like them and I don't like, I mean, I don't mind them, but I don't want to do them because I, my sense is you've had this beautiful party and you've spent who knows how much and um, everything is, is gorgeous. And then here's this little afterthought. That's fine. It's a lovely thought. But I was off favors, and Gates, you'll remember this. Our middle child got married at our farm, and we had the, um, you know, obligatory lunch with the future in-laws, and the mother-in-law, <clears throat> I'm old-fashioned. To me, the, the wedding is the bride's province, and so the mother-in-law had a suggestion, and she said with excitement, why don't, we, um, why don't we do favors and have little pine saplings in burlap bags with a tie and um, with a card on it that says, I think I shall never see a thing as lovely as a tree. And this is what I said, and y'all can use this because it works. I said, great idea, and I never thought about doing it. But she was validated, and she was heard, and it was a great idea, but I wasn't going to do it, and I knew she wasn't. <laughs> so um, another friend of Ours is Chessie Breen, who some of you may know is, um, she's a publicist and a marketing uh, queen of, uh, for design and designers and design books. And um, this is a Mother's Day luncheon that she put together with her daughters in East Hampton. And I included this because it's so simple. And another one of my burdens is for the next generation to live graciously and to not rely on Ikea and um, restoration hardware and um, plastic utensils and things like that. So this was perfect to uh, illustrate that message. The little girls, her three little girls, did all the flowers and did the place cards. And so as you can see, garden roses and hydrangeas, if you're afraid to arrange, if you're intimidated like I was, just get you some garden roses or hydrangeas or both because they, they really arrange themselves. And there they are. There's Chessie and her cute little girls who are now not little. They're still cute and very floral. And then just the simplicity, the beauty of this one garden rose in a just a sort of smoky eggplant little bud vase. These little girls, each one of them, were, when they were born, they had their own silver pattern. And so how much do I love them? And so they take turns setting the table with their uh, silver pattern and they get really excited. And so my heart leapt when I heard this. And here's their Mother's Day luncheon with their beautiful Gracie wallpaper and some very muted pastels and um, just a really simple but elegant um, table. Charlotte Moss is a friend. She also wrote the foreword to the book. I don't know if y'all know this, but she's a superb gardener and flower arranger. Um, and of course, a great interior designer. But so she put together a luncheon for us, El Fresco luncheon, and she used all, just a mishmash of things, and including that um, latticework, uh, Nancy it's called, China. It's named after Nancy Lancaster, who is one of her uh, inspirations. She, uh, Charlotte is a Virginia girl as well. These are her garden roses. She grows them and arranges them and then she just mixed them with this wonderful Indian print and um, some vintage glasses and bamboo flatware. And there she is in her McKinnon Harris um, sofa with her Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. This flower room, my husband is an Episcopal priest and tells me always not to covet, but, <laughs> sorry, this is something that I will never have, but I covet it. It's, it's Charlotte's flower room, and it's in her house in East Hampton, and this is where she goes when she gets out there. She gets her snips and her basket and her uh, 
Crocs or whatever she wears and goes and cuts and comes back and she has a set, you can't see from this angle, thousands of baskets and jardiniere and uh, just little vases and votives and things. And so then she just puts them together here like in this little porcelain um, vase on the right. She has a glass of wine and her husband's out playing golf on their little uh, little uh, practice tee and uh, it's just, it's idyllic. So this was a little spillover from the shoot, but I wanted to include it <clears throat> because I like the simplicity of one pot of geraniums. And I think, you know, it's just, what else do you need? And you can't improve upon perfection. So people who are intimidated about arranging or decorating um, with flowers, you, you're starting with something that's perfect. So don't be scared. And there's Charlotte clipping her roses. <clears throat> and to the right is a, um, a piece, Chinese fretwork piece that, that Charlotte bought from Bunny Mellon's auction at Sotheby's. I don't know if y'all are aware, uh, that auction brought $500 million for her pieces. Um, she had a lot of stuff. And she was <coughs> so chic, you know, Bunny, everything she did and had was so chic. Charlotte is a visual, 100% visual person, and when she travels, she just takes a thousand pictures. And this is a Hickory Pavilion that she spotted uh, in France, and it's the Notre Dame de Prairie d'Orsan. And I can't remember who the garden designer was and who the designer was that made this, but she brought pictures home, and somebody uh, replicated it it for her a little less formal. But then she brings her trip home and puts it in her garden. It's just kind of fun and evocative. So fall, um, another, all of these are Michael Devine's um, patterns. Ashley Whitaker is another good friend. She um, lives now in Millbrook. This is a, a little fall uh, feast that she put together for us. And she gathered all the flora from the, the farm. It's a dressage farm in Millbrook. But my favorite, and I'm coveting again, is this <laughs> erstwhile munitions wagon that um, is obviously retrofitted and is now a party wagon, as we called it. And so that was the, the starting point for this lunch. And um, I just, it just made, I mean, I think it would have been a nice piece without it, but it totally makes it to me. And so some of the guests, and then this aerial shot to show you that the, it's not super floral, but it's very botanical with the faux bois and the staghorn flatware, and then Michael Smith's um, botanical fabric as a runner. And then here you have an antique bucket and, uh, a still be and things from around the property, just nothing fancy. And if you'll note this picture up on the left, that anybody can do that. I mean, anybody can do that. You're starting with this beautiful greenery, and I think I can't tell what those other flowers are, but it's just so simple and rustic and um, unfussy. So that's another one of my uh, messages. Wendy Wurzberger in Philadelphia is the, was, I don't think she's anymore, the creative director at Anth Anthropology. And so you might kind of glean that this is from someone who worked at Anthropology and set their, their uh, template, their visual template. Another coveting situation, this house outside of Philadelphia, to me it's just perfection. And that it's Wendy's house. And then she styled every tableau in this shoot and for this luncheon. And that, I, I mean, we should have paid her. That was just so extraordinary to have the woman who does all, did all the visuals for anthropology styling our photo shoot. An ingenious little you know, trunk with a uh, round and uh, just a simple bench with gourds. We did not sit on that bench, as you can imagine, because we would have had to clear off the gourds. <laughs> Here's um, some nasturtiums, obviously, that are edible, and then we had those in our lunch. Here's Wendy in her cool floral velvet blazer setting her table with her bentwood chairs, and just, I love how that kind of recaps the bent 
wisteria trunk. And just pretty. I, I'm not a cook or a baker, but that's just pretty. And then this little moment here on the right um, that we actually did use, but the way it was set up, we hated to touch it, but it's just uh, the inclusion of produce and flowers um, in this little uh, setting. So this is sort of vintage, um, windy, and anthropology, just the mix of different china patterns, all floral for the most part, and then this Velme flatware that she found, and then cotton napkins from Guatemala. Another runner. This one we did not use Oasis, we wisened up. James Carter, does anybody know James? He's from Birmingham. Um, a good friend of mine and a real talent. This is his house in Birmingham that he allowed us in. We were supposed to have um, a brunch. It was the weekend of the Birmingham Antique Show. And Julia, precious Julia Reed, was going to be in the story. And she was cooking and James was just going to stand there and show us his house. And um, she had to fly out because we had a monsoon. And she had to get out early to L.A. because she was going to interview Oprah. And we thought, okay, we, we can't compete with that. We will release you. But we hated that and now really hate it. So this is James's house. And it's a mix, but it's primarily pretty classical with his William Kent console. But what we liked and what I wanted to highlight was the... <clears throat> the sort of eclectic use of containers. This is just a very humble uh, watering can on the left with uh, Sybil Sylvester did the flowers and this was just fall offerings, mostly local, which we always try to do. There's James's dining room. It's one of the prettiest rooms I think I've ever seen, I have to say. And um, the color, the lacquer, the Dijon, the just, and then the little persimmon leather uh, seat cushions and then Sybil doing this. This is just a detail of that centerpiece, but in a honey bucket with just very fall offerings and <clears throat> not fancy. And there is James and he had lost a bunch of weight when we took this <laughs> picture and he loves it. He has numerous copies. But <laughs> And he looks good. He looks good. But what you don't see in this picture, and this is the magic of, of you know, uh, publishing, there was that monsoon that came through. And on this um, beautiful herringbone brick porch with a screen porch, we had, up until this photograph, we had shop vacs and mops and brooms and whatever we could find to get the water out of there. And then also, the fabulous centerpiece with the grasses and greenery from James's yard tumped over, of course. Luckily, Sybil was there to set it aright. But um, I wanted this for the cover of the book. And because I had never published a book, I deferred to the professionals at Rizzoli and picked the other image. Um, but I think this is a little too fall, I guess, but I loved it. I think it's just a really clean graphic image, and it tells my story. Not a, not a fancy arrangement, but a really beautiful uh, transferware vase, I think. I can't tell from here. Um, but just pretty, simple. So winter, Alex Hits, anybody? Alex Hits? We love Alex. He is, he sort of is um, our resident tastemaker at Flower because he, he's a great chef, but he writes well, he does flowers beautifully and sets a really fine table. This is a Christmas Eve party that he does every year. I don't think he did it this year in LA. But he's again, those, those gold um, Christmas trees are again from Michael's as he confessed. So I don't know how much they cost, but not much. And then he pairs them with his uh, Amari and his Francis I silver, and then just a pile of apples in a fluted, uh, footed console. I mean, compote. So I think, you know, simple, elegant, and then um, a little cheeky. And speaking of cheeky, there he is, getting ready for the pate. And 
My favorite thing about this shoot is that Alex used carnations. And I love carnations. <laughs> they get a bad rep. They do. But carnations are inexpensive. They are roughly. They are rich looking. And, and they last. I did a Christmas party for flower at my house about five years ago. And the whole tree was red carnations just stuck into the branches, not even a water source. White lights and red carnations, and it lasted for about a week. So they also endure. So I'm a big um, carnation booster. And these are just pretty details. We love the repoussé silver for obvious reasons with the whole floral um, motif. <clears throat> but then the Amari as well, and um, just the beautiful candelabra and the monogram <coughs> heirloom napkin. I don't know who irons his linens, but they do a great job. So Mindy Rice is one of the great uh, event designers. She's from the West Coast, and she um, produced this. She does a wreath-making party every year, and she let us um, photograph it. And so there's only one prerequisite. She has friends from all over, but they have to forage their materials. And so here she's been drying roses from her property. Um, and then she has the workshop in the barn with the goat. And there she is dressing the little, um, the little door handle. And then here's her class and every detail, every detail, just like so many of y'all that are in design, every detail is thought of. And you have to be when you're an event designer. <coughs> But I love this little lady who would not let us shoot her face. She was, <laughs> she was so humble and modest, but we insisted we wanted that wreath because it's different and it's really, really pretty. And then Mindy, the event planner, designer, everybody had a little canvas covered uh, bucket for their plant material with a leather handle and their name beautifully scripted on the little card and um, good for her. I, you know, I can't operate that way, but I'm so glad we can pay people to do that. And then um, just the red throughout the theme. Um, these are uh, remnants. These are things that she picked up off the floor and made a little arrangement in this picture. And when I saw that, I thought, what on earth is she putting cotton in there for? She's in California. And then someone, I think maybe at Stratford when I spoke, informed me that there is cotton in California. And I thought, okay, good. I needed to know that. So y'all, there's cotton <laughs> in California. Um, so Becky Vizard, who some of y'all know, um, has opened a shop in New Orleans, is a dear friend, and she uh, allowed us to come and photograph her house in St. Joseph for uh, Christmas. And those are her signature stockings that are made from fab um, fragments of her fabric. Becky, as you may know, discovered a niche in design. She was decorating, and she couldn't find any pillows that were fancy but not ostentatious and too elaborate. So she set about making them and traveled the world and found, you know, braid and ecclesiastical um, patterns and uh, fortuny, antique fortuny and things like that. And now she is making some of the most beautiful creations I've ever seen. And there's one on the left in her living room. And she makes these little stockings, and I have enough to cover my tree now. I, I, I get one or two every year, and so, um, but they're great as little treats and little um, little additions to your Christmas wrapping. So this is her breakfast room, Christmas morning ish, and one of the reasons I wanted to include this, I love that compote with the oranges in it, and my mother always put an orange in the bottom of my stocking at Christmas. Anybody else? Do y'all know why? See, this is one of those things, not going to save the world, but I love knowing this. In the 18th century in England, citrus was so rare 
that if you gave someone an orange or a lemon, it was like giving them gold. And so that has just translated across the Atlantic and down through the years in our family, especially, and a few others. And so I love that she had an entire compote full of citrus. I think that's just, it's just a gentle nod to cultural history. And here is her living room with her Brittany Spaniels. And can I tell you a little story about my Brittany Spaniel? <laughs> Who I bought off Instagram. And her name is Elsie DeWolf. And I don't know if y'all know who Elsie DeWolf was, but anyway, she was the first great decorator. And um, she looks a lot like that one on the left. And she would no more be sitting there than flying to the moon. She'd be, everything in there would be toe up. But on the left, Becky has gathered um, these beautiful ornaments and put them in a clush. And I saw that and I thought, how did she do that? It's magic. It's a miracle. Because I, I could picture her pouring them out and then scooping the, and then trying, and she said, Margot, glue gun. And so, <laughs> so you know, er, so this um, breezeway on the left was all white. All the decorations were white. And we sent the chapter to Becky, and she said, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know what I was thinking. I would never do all white at this house for Christmas. And she said, can y'all come back and shoot? Um, I'll do red. And, and we thought, and I said, Becky, there's such a thing as Photoshop. So we changed all the white to red, and we didn't have to go to St. Joseph again, although we love it. And so here is her guest room with her beautiful uh, pillow with the gold braid and a French headboard with gold embroidery and she said this was a Suzani throw. It doesn't look like any Suzani I've ever seen, but it is from Uzbekistan, so maybe they're different there. But just layers of beauty and texture and laughter. I don't know if y'all know Becky and Michael, but they are so fun. And this is their version of a party wagon. It's kind of a gypsy wagon, and she's decorated that and um, just red everywhere, even on his scarf. So we're finishing up with spring. This is Chris Spitzmiller's house, Clovebrook Farm in Millbrook. And we wanted to photograph his house and garden because he is really kind of a renaissance guy. He cooks, he, he's obviously a potter, wonderful artist. He grows, he gardens, and he has designed his um, pool pavilion. He just kind of does it all. Lilacs, we don't have lilacs down here, do we? We don't have them in Birmingham either, and I, I get kind of envious because they smell so good. He has branched out into floral um, tableware now. These chocolate cosmos on the left, I think, are really fun and, and spunky. And then here's Chris doing um, setting the table, and those are all flowers from his garden. He arranged them. So uh, they were kind of tall, and I said, Chris, you know, those... We're not going to be able to see each other, and um, we won't be able to talk to each other except somebody on our, on our side. And he said, tough. And I mean, he really, and I said, okay, well, you're the host, so do whatever you want. Sat down, picked up the flowers, and put them on a console. So, you know, sometimes you just have to learn by doing or not doing. This papier peint, this Chinese paper, is something that he found in, I think, from John Roselli in a warehouse somewhere, something very unlikely and um, off the beaten path. And then this modern sunburst mirror with the antique paper, I think, is really great with that rose metallic, is, picks up the color in the flowers and um, the, the flora. And then on the right, that actually is a Porto tablecloth, um, vintage, obviously. And then the Francis Elkins loop chairs that he gathered over the years. And I, I like that so much about Chris because he doesn't just go out and buy a bunch of stuff. He waits, and it's worth it. Um, so P. Allen Smith is a good friend of ours, and this is his farm, Moss Mountain Farm in um, Arkansas. It's the Arkansas River. I think this vista is one of the prettiest ever. And who would think it's in Arkansas? Until you go to Arkansas, which I have done, and it's beautiful. 
So here we have our um, alfresco tablet. It looks like that's about all we did for this book, and it kind of is. But it's just prettier. Light's prettier outside, and then you have nature. And Alan set the tables, and we are there with the photographer, and literally this horse sashayed into the frame and started grazing. And I'm, I know you believe me, because who could have made him do that? Nobody. And there's Alan, the barkeep. And um, he is another Renaissance guy. He does everything, um, arranging. He, does, he did some of the cooking, not all of it, and then styling. And um, he also collects exotic chickens. He raises exotic chickens. So if y'all are into that, um, go on his Instagram because they're quite dramatic. I'm not a chicken lover except to eat, but they are really fabulous. So another Elsie DeWolf mention, um, this little uh, place card was invented by, I said, by Alan Smith with the gold paint pen, the name, and the little frog, which is clever. And um, so I was describing this somewhere, I can't remember where, and somebody else raised her hand and said, no, he didn't invent that. Elsie DeWolf invented that. And I thought, okay, so now y'all know. <laughs> Alan, do not give him credit for that place card. <laughs> then we're closing with Bunny Williams, who I know y'all all know, she's the real deal. Just like Charlotte, they are masters of numerous disciplines. And um, Bunny, this is at her house in um, Falls Village, Connecticut and they grow lilac again a little bit jealous still and there's the house the iconic uh, front elevation of the, her house in falls village this is just a little quiet in the living room that i wanted to shoot because i like cozy and i like an angle shot and i can picture myself there but what i really like is that she had grown these tulips in her parterre garden and there was something missing, and she went and grabbed that cushion from somewhere, and it just made it. You know, again, not going to save the world, but it, it just makes a difference and pulls everything together. We've seen this. This is her conservatory where she has dinner parties all the time. And, um, and so her theme, her color theme, obviously uh, came from the lilacs. John Rosselli. Last minute, Bunny went and picked little um, pansies and put them on the napkin, kind of like those peonies in the Elaine Griffin piece. Um, <clears throat> nothing fancy, just a nice little touch of nature there. This is in her barn, this huge arrangement in a faux mile urn. Um, she actually, it's the only thing Bunny didn't do. She had to get her gardener in there to get up on the stepladder. <clears throat> Everything grown by Bunny. And there she is, and she, this was not posed, this was not stage. Bunny was doing the centerpieces for the table. And then I just went around the house and found all these floral mentions and said, shoot this, shoot that. So in this powder room with this document, um, uh, wallpaper, and then I think there's some toll auriculas over on the left, and then on the right, a Claire Potter cluster of lilacs, and then the Susani floral throw over the bed, still lives with flowers and trees, just nature everywhere, even inside. And then on the left, it's another part of her living room uh, that we were going to shoot as is, just a corner, and I said, hold the phone, and I went to her container cupboard, which, if you can imagine, uh, was replete and just like drinking from a fire hose of beautiful vases. But I found this little handmade um, bud vase and went to the front arrangement and purloined a little um, stem of the Solomon seal. And I see, I think that's pretty. And I don't think, you know, that was pretty easy, but it made a difference. And then on the right is the guest room in the um, barn. Again, nothing hugely floral, but Bridget Singh's silk uh, fabric on the bed, Robert Kime floral pattern on the chair, uh, just some geraniums at the end of the room. So you're not overwhelmed with chintzy, chintzy, chintz, but you have that idea <clears throat> that you're near a garden, if not in it. Mimi Brown, 
is um, someone who now works in New York. She has Mimi Brown Studio, but she started out with us at Flower. She had a department in the magazine called Mimi's Mechanics. And she would do arrangements and we would break it down. So when we wanted to do some step-by-steps for the back of the book, there are five, we called Mimi into town. And so on the left is a runner that she did for us. And then on the right is a tall jardinier of mine that was my mother's, and she did a beautiful, uh, loose, gardeny uh, tulip arrangement in that. And both of those and three more are step by step in the back. So you see the chicken wire. We we really encourage chicken wire and water. But don't don't get mad when you look at that step by step for the uh, for the runner because she did use. Oasis. Anyway, and it, again, there's a place for it, but um, I shouldn't have, we shouldn't have advocated for that. So that's the end. It's the same as the beginning is the Caroline, and I want to just give another nod to her because she's why I'm standing here. And thank you all for coming to hear me. And <laughs> questions? Anybody want to start a magazine, write a book? Nope. Does anybody have any questions for Margo? Huh? Questions from the audience? What we any questions? All right. Well, it was fabulous. Thank you so much. So appreciate it. Huge round of applause for Margo. I'm Ann Red, and I'm a volunteer with um, Art and Bloom, and we're going to take a quick 10-minute break to stretch your legs. Uh, use the ladies or the gentlemen's room and um, so just be back at uh, 1045 and we'll get started on the second lecture. Thanks so much.